So, the God complex, right? Um, I would like to be God, and if I can't be God, I will settle for being your God. And so, um, we talked a little bit about humanity and the human soul, how, how important that is to, to make sure that we're allowing people access to being whole. Um, we also talked about some important dates in terms of the United States and, and this 101 year gap. Um, I'm, I'm not so much, um, well, we, we know that that's a, a gap that is still plaguing us today, right? So it explains a number of things that we currently see in our society. Why education rates between the dominant group and, and subordinate groups um, is so different. The wealth gap is so different. The, um, the health dis disparities are so great. And so um, those dates are, are helpful in explaining those things. And lastly, this, this God complex shows itself in the, the system of discrimination. And one of the things that we said was that in 1964, um, discrimination was not only defined, but segregation was outlawed. So segregation was outlawed and discrimination was defined as a part of a legal process. And so one of the, the, the important concepts that we'll go over, we won't talk all about um, discrimination, but I want to share these two concepts uh, as well as talking about micro inequities and how those show up in, uh, in our workplaces. And so um, one of the, the, uh, the, the descriptors of, or one of the key concepts of discrimination is the concept of impact versus intent. And so what impact versus intent implies is that it is not, um, so let, let's give an example. So someone says a, um, a racially charged or a, uh, a gender specific um, joke that is harmful. It is not, to, it's not designed to uplift the human um, spirit, the human wholeness. It's designed actually to tear it down, to create divisiveness in the workplace, all for the sake of humor or a cheap laugh. Well. If a person says, uh, delivers this joke, and you always know when these jokes are coming because the person always says, can I tell you a joke? They ask you before they try to tell the, the bad joke. And one of the things that we have to realize is that um, when they ask us, we know something bad is coming, so we need to say no right off the top. The second thing is that, um, is that it is not that the... the the joke that gets measured, it is the impact of that behavior. And so someone tells that joke, someone um, reports that to HR or to a supervisor or a manager, and the person comes back after they've been confronted and said, you know what, I didn't mean it. It was just a joke. I was trying to be funny. Well, what, what the 1964 Civil Rights Act says in, in, the, in the definition of discrimination is that it is not the intent that is measured, it is the impact that is measured. And so if I swat a, a coworker on the behind as he or she goes by and we're not on the softball team together, that will be considered what? Sexual harassment, right? And so sexual harassment is a form of discrimination that is particularly not accepted in the workplace. And so this form of, of discrimination being sexual harassment, I, if I'm confronted with that and I say, you know what, I didn't mean it, I, I was trying to be you know, jokey, I was trying to cheer them up, the court will not recognize people's intent, it will recognize the impact of that behavior. So if, I, uh, if, if I'm going through interviews and interviews and I say, you know what, um, and, and, and it is noticeable that some of these very well-qualified candidates are Hispanic, and, and I'm not selecting some of these well-qualified um, candidates, and they fit the, the minimum qualifications, they have great interviews, but I have some kind of uh, bias towards Hispanic folks, and that shows up um, over a period of time. And one of the things people don't recognize is that typically when organizations get involved with this discrimination, they're not identifying individuals because of a particular incident, but they are recognizing there's a pattern of human behavior that they have to address. 
Um, and so when, when folks engage in, in you know, dealing with discrimination, it is not because of one incident. It's because there's been a series of incidences, and this one is the one that we have to address because this could be the tipping point on, uh, uh, for this issue in our organization. And so um, the courts will look at the impact versus the intent, and that is for discrimination. Discrimination is a legal process. Um, and, I, and I'm going to keep saying that because this next piece that we're going to do, you're going to see how important that is. And so uh, discrimination of, of any kind, so sex, creed, uh, color, um, religious background, uh, pregnancy, um, disability or, or limited ability, all of those things are forms that are um, the forms of, of, of human existence that are covered under the 1964 Civil Rights Act. And discrimination against those protected classes is, um, is inappropriate, right? It is illegal to discriminate against those, those protected classes. Now, one of the things that, that I've learned by you know, being um, an affirmative action officer, an EEO investigator, uh, a part of the, the you know, human resource being a part of human resource teams, is that oftentimes people don't quite get to this level, right? To, to either breaking the law or um, being in situations that HR or human resources or the affirmative action officer or the EEO um, officer uh, or the ombudsman even has to deal with. So all too often we've done a good job of training folks so that we don't get to this discrimination part. However, there are small things that people do that walk that line. So it's like, you know, there's a line in the sand and someone will come up to the line and they'll, you know, they, they'll, you know, they won't cross the line, but they'll get as close to it as possible, right? And so those things we're going to call micro inequities and microaggressions, right? So these are these things that aren't illegal, but they're close, right? So, um, so for example, microaggressions um, really focus on intent versus impact, right? So, for example, um, a microaggression in terms of looking at intent versus impact, the, the microaggressions would be um, things that I might say that don't recognize human wholeness, that try to drive a wedge between the body and the spirit and make someone feel less than who they are, right? And so, uh, for example, we, uh, we meet at 9 o'clock, and so a group of us get together, and we have a meeting at 8.45. So you walk into the meeting that started 15 minutes ago, and you've missed part of the meeting. Or the meeting location has changed, and we... We fail to recognize that you need to know that information. So that is the intent that creates this impact. And, and the funny thing is that these, these small microaggressions, these small things. So, um, you know, uh, someone comes into your office to talk with you and you keep typing as opposed to talking to them. What are you saying to them? You're saying that they're less human, that their humanity isn't as important as A, what you're doing, or the person that you're talking to. Um, you're telling a joke, and someone walks into the room, and you, everybody goes silent. Whether you're talking about them or not, it gives the impression, it is a microaggression that gives the impression that you're diminishing their humanity, right? Um, having, um, sharing political um, jokes that you receive through your email, um, posting those political pictures in your cubicle area uh, that you get through your email. These are microaggressions. They're not, they're not actually discrimination yet, but they are microaggressions and micro inequities that contribute to the second part of, um, of discrimination, which is a hostile work environment. And so, based on my, my race, my creed, my color, my gender, um, my nationality, or my uh, religious affiliation, and I'm feeling these microaggressions, 
They may not be discrimination, but they could be contributing to a hostile work environment. And a hostile work environment is one in which not only is your humanity not recognized as a, as a whole, you're not recognized as a whole person, but it's also to teach you a lesson about what the, the norms of this organization um, should be and are and how those things get demonstrated. And so intent versus impact becomes extremely important. I don't know if you've ever received a gift from someone who was forced to give it to you. Be that gift an, an apology or, um, or, or some tangible device. But any time that I've gotten something that someone was forced to give me or they were made to do it and they didn't do it out of the kindness of their own heart, I don't even want that thing, right? Um, all too often, I mean, someone could bring me a, 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 a Lexus and they say, well, I just gave this to you because you were dot, 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 dot. Or I had to dot, 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 dot. And, and what I would, you know, what I would do with that, first, if it was a Lexus, I, I'd take it, but, but then I'd sell it just so I have the money because I don't want anything from that person, right? So you don't even feel connected to that person because their gift was, was not a gift that was given out of their, their heart and their appreciation for your humanity. It was something that was imposed upon them, right? And so, you know, that, that, so that begs the, the question, right, that goes back to this 101 years. Because someone asked me once, you know, Andre, um, that... 1964 did it. it. It solved the stuff. We have uh, an African-American president. Um, we've done uh, uh, over 101 years stuff. We fixed that. Um, how long do we keep it? How long do we have to keep talking about diversity stuff? How long do we have to keep, you know, going over these things? And, and I'll tell you exactly what I told them. And I, I asked them, how, how long does an alcoholic have to go um, to those meetings? Right? Um, how many cancer treatments does it take to, to get rid of a metastasized, metastasized tumor, right? Um, how, how long does it take for someone to, uh, to stop smoking cigarettes, to get over either the physical or the emotional um, effects of, of, of smoking cigarettes? And so my, my ultimate answer was, I don't know, but it will take as long as it takes. One of the things that we have to recognize is that our, our systems, our, uh, just looking at this discrimination stuff, the reason that we have the laws is because we have a sickness, and the sickness is called racism. How do we get over that sickness? We have to be vigilant, right? Um, another thing that I suggested to that person, ask a person who, who survived the Nazi camp, concentration camp how long they should keep talking about Nazi concentration camps. They have to keep talking about it so that we're reminded so we don't do it again. And so, you know, how many times you have to brush your teeth before uh, they're clean? You have to brush your teeth as long as you have them. Right? So, so when we talk about these, these systems, when we talk about this discrimination stuff, why do we have to keep talking about this? We have to keep talking about it, and we have to keep working on it until it is alleviated, or at, or at least until it is no longer problematic for us. You know, I, I like to think about, um, you know, racism and discrimination like, like athlete's foot. If you keep it in check, it's not a problem for you. You keep your shoes dry, you change your socks on a regular basis, you use medication, you don't have a problem with athlete's foot. However, if you don't pay attention to athlete's foot, you don't do those things, and you wear the same pairs of socks for six months and the same pair of shoes for six months, you will have some very bad results from that fungus, right? And so we have to be vigilant. We have to be mindful of those things because we need to make sure that people are able to be whole, that we recognize people's humanity, that we're in the service of them. And I would say that uh, discrimination is the antithesis of that. And so microaggressions are the small things that add up, that add up, that add up ultimately to this the system of discrimination. And so how do we avoid the system of discrimination or, or engaging in micro inequities um, and engaging in microaggressions? Um, we do that by this one thing. We recognize that there is dignity and honor in being human. 
that, that human beings were, we were born whole, but the world that we're born into is broken. And the world that we're born into is trying to make sure that we are, that we are cracked, that we're separated from, from our spirit. Um, that this wholeness comes when I recognize that there's dignity in honor of being human. And dignity simply says that I recognize your right to exist, even if I don't agree uh, as to how you're existing, but you have the right to exist because I'm not God. Right? I'm not God. And so you have the right to exist, dignity. And so I have a responsibility to treat you a particular way. And I have to treat you with honor. And honor is the highest level of respect. Honor is reserved for those, those folks who have done great things, particularly those folks who have done great things on our behalf that we could not do for ourselves. That's who honor is, is reserved for. Um, so there's dignity and honor in being human. None of us did anything to bring ourselves here. We're only accepting an invitation. I don't want to think about how that invitation came. It, it's very, um, it's disgusting. But we all accepted an invitation, and we're trying to figure out what it means to be human. We're trying to figure out how, how, how does my spirit and my body connect? How do I define humanity? How do I recognize humanity in other people, particularly when they have not recognized it in me? Um, how do I... How am I in the service of other people? How do I help us build this, this human family in a way that, that creates and changes our paradigms and allows us to live lives that are complete and full, regardless of the, the situations that we find ourselves in, the environments that we find ourselves in? How do, I, how do I connect with other human beings to make sure that that happens? And when we're able to do that, that is when we recognize that we are not God. This God complex becomes ineffective when we recognize that, that we are trying to do the same thing that everyone else is trying to do. We're trying to look for significance, belonging, and safety. And we're trying to do that by recognizing the dignity and honor in other human beings. Because if we keep with this God complex, um, we'll be very frustrated because we can't get everything. We can't control everything. All we can do is what my grandmother would say, the only thing that we run is our mouths and our shoes. We can run our shoes. Right? And so um, I, I would encourage you, as you continue on this journey, to, to analyze what parts of your life are you imploring the God complex. If I can't be the boss, uh, if I can't be God, then I'll be the boss of you. And recognizing that that becomes ineffectual when we start talking about the dignity and honor and being human. My name is Andre Cohen. Thank you for your time today, and we'll see you soon.